OK, let's get started. Um, so most of us know that we should write tests. It's all over the internet and so many different talks and so many blog posts. So even though there can be some cons, um, it can take more time up front, it can feel tedious to write. Um, there's so many things that make testing good, um, and it's the thing that we should do. It encourages better architecture, it can catch regressions, and it can save dev time later on, um, catch bugs before they go out. So many great things. And we also know that Kotlin has some really nice features, um, introducing expressiveness and making development a bit more enjoyable. So in this talk, we're going to explore how we can bring those things together. Because we like Kotlin for transforming our code and making it more understandable and enjoyable to write. And we can do that same for our test code. It can give us less code in general, and it's nice having a single company creating the language and the IDE to create a nice experience, but what else do we got? For some people, they introduce Kotlin to their code base first through tests, seeing some of those benefits right away in their code base. Um, but a lot of times, this is when they're first learning Kotlin, and they might not recognize all of the tools that they have available to them. And there's a lot of great ways that people are using Kotlin in their tests. So in this talk, we're going to look at some of those examples. We're first going to look at some Kotlin features and see how they might be useful in our tests. And then we're going to look at some really great libraries that utilize these features that you can plug in and use in your own testing. And these libraries can do a great job of making your testing more pleasant, um, remove some of the boilerplate, and make your code more expressive. Which is really great in that tests are often a form of documentation, living documentation. So to make those tests more expressive, it means that your living documentation is better. When I was preparing for this talk, I put this question out on Twitter. And I'm really thankful for all of the responses that I got. And you'll see them scattered throughout the presentation. I uh, wanted to make sure that I highlighted what a lot of different people are doing. I know the testing that I'm doing at work and uh, some other people that I've talked to. But I wanted to also see what everyone else was doing. And it was really cool to see all of the responses and all of the different things that people are doing, different preferences. And I think it was. It's a really great testament to how we each have our preferences. Believe it or not, developers have opinions. Um, and they were happy to share them. And I think it's a beautiful thing to be able to compare and look at these in order to learn from it, pick out the things that you do like, maybe learn something new to try and find out if you like it or not, and be able to just learn more that way and explore. Before we dive in too quick, um, just a couple words about who it is up here speaking to you. I'm an Android developer at Buffer. We're a fully remote company. Our apps help you reach your, companies, reach your customers and grow your brand through social media, using planning, um, collaborating with your team, and measuring your performance. I'm also on the Ray Wunderlich team on their Android and Kotlin team making learning materials on those topics. Um, I also have that cat and that hedgehog as my pets. I love them, and can you believe that their previous caretakers didn't want them? Um, neither of them were wanted. I was happy to rescue them. All right, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, the cat is Peter Pan. And the hedgehog is Kashik, and come talk to me after. I will talk to them, talk about them, forever. <laughs> All right, language features. Um, a lot of these things are things that you've likely seen before if you've been working with Kotlin, but we're going to look at them through a testing perspective. Um, so even if you introduce Kotlin to your app starting with test, as so many have you may not have considered all of those options at that time. 
Or maybe you did and decided you didn't like it, which is cool too. So I hope that with this, you're able to learn some more tools and possibly make testing more fun. And we'll start with backticks, starting simple. These can be used to write more readable test names in many people's opinion. And they're an escaping character. They're often used to escape a Kotlin keyword that's valid in Java, such as in or object or is. And it's used for interoperability in that way. But it can be used to escape much more than that. And when talking about this on Twitter, this is one of the most mentioned Kotlin features that I heard about. And they liked it for in helping with naming and increased readability. So this is a test name without back, back ticks. Um, we have kind of a mix of camel and snake case here to divide it and have our win and our expectation. And then with backticks, you can re make you can write test names that read like a sentence. You can put anything in there, and most importantly in this case, spaces. So instead of using that combination of snake and camel that some people like to use for a given, when, then formatted tests, you also have the option to write a test name that describes what the test is doing. So here we have a database test. And we want to know that when we call delete updates, it only deletes the corresponding updates, the corresponding data. And we write that out as a sentence. And this extends further than just when you're writing and reading tests. It also feeds into the error messages you need to parse when your tests fail as well. So instead of reading your lumpy snake of a test name, to find your broken code, you can read a hopefully well thought out sentence. You do have to watch out a little bit if you're working on an Android project, as right now you can only use this with uh, J pure JUnit tests that run off device, um, last time that I checked. All of this is accomplished by, this surrounding, by surrounding this function name with this single powerful special character. But this is a pretty simple thing, and we know Kotlin can do a lot more. So next on our journey, we'll look at higher order functions. With higher order functions, you can pass a function to another function. So in other words, you can pass some logic in as a parameter. This is because functions are first class citizens in Kotlin. This can be really helpful for sharing logic in your code as well as creating custom DSLs. And then we'll see in a minute that you can take an additional step with this in your UI tests by using them to create screen robots. And people are really liking this for custom assertions. It's useful for creating screen robots. And I also got some specific examples that, of higher order functions that people like. Creating helper higher order functions in your code can improve quality, and this applies to your tests too. These can be used especially for logic that has a start and an end that you frequently use. Maybe that's setup and teardown, maybe it's initialization and assertion. It could be as simple as wrapping something in a should fail with block. So the sky's the limit here. One example we use is for testing the launch of a browser with a specific URL. To do this manually, this requires a bit of setup and teardown in both the success and the fail state. And it can be a lot when there's multiple tests that need it. So here's an example of a higher order function that we wrote, and this is to verify that a link was opened in the browser. We have two parameters. We have the expected URL that should be opened. And then we have this lambda that's passed in that is, contains whatever code is supposed to open that link. Maybe it's clicking on a button. We have to start it by initializing intents. This is the library that we're using um, to verify that the browser was open, basically. And then we have this try finally, 
Um, no matter what happens, we have to release this intents that we just initialized. So we have that in the finally block. Then finally in the try block, we call that open link function that was passed in to perform whatever actions it's supposed to open the browser. And then we have our verification. So we basically just verify that that URL was opened. And then when we call it, we just call verify link open, give it that URL, and give it the code that should open that link. And by using this custom helper, we're able to greatly simplify our tests by making them more readable and more fun to write. So without it, we'd have to put all that setup and tear down in each test that we need to verify something like this. And now we can take this example of writing tests for the UI a little bit further with screen robots. And I don't mean an electronic device with a stylus that will click around on the screen for you and take care of all your click testing. As far as I know, Kotlin hasn't added this feature. So I'm watching the change logs for it. Screen robots can make your test more expressive and readable and easier to change if something changes in your UI. So you abstract the logic to perform actions on the screen and make verifications into the robot. So if something on the screen changes, you only need to update the robot instead of all of the tests that use it. So here's an example for a tip calculator. We have this calculator screen robot, and it extends from screen robot, which has some additional helpers on it that we'll call. We put two functions on it. One of them is verify tip is correct. So this just checks that the field that's supposed to display the tip displays the correct tip that's passed in as a string. And then we have a second one, input check amount and select OK button. So this inputs an amount into a field and then clicks a button. And these like check view has text, enter text into view. These are all functions in the generic screen robot. And then when you call it, you call with robot, with that robot, and then you chain it with the methods. But this isn't very kotlin -y. This isn't using higher order functions. And there's a lot more we can do here. So here is a possible solution using a higher order function with this. Um, it looks a lot more kotlin -y. Um, we have something called robot, it's the function, and we pass a block to it. And then we have those actions that we want to perform. Input an amount and press a button. Verify that the tip is correct. And this is a really simple example, but it starts to hint at how using higher order functions and custom DSLs can start to clean up your robot code and your test code. Next, we'll look at extension functions. And this provides the ability to extend a class with new functionality without having to inherit from a class or use some sort of design pattern like a decorator. Um, we can add new methods that can be called directly on an instance of the extended class without inheriting it or wrapping it. Um, you can even extend a final class like string. And it's resolved statically. So it's similar to creating like a static utility function. In fact, under the hood, it's basically the same thing. But it's nicer to look at when it's written in Kotlin. This can be helpful to more easily test the properties of objects that we're testing. And if not more easily, it can be more readable. And they can be really great for creating DSLs and to help get data out of objects under test. So here's an example without using an extension function. We have this view model, this content view model, with some sort of state. It's a queue state. And we're checking that the value is loading. And that's a lot of words to read just to say, does this view model have the state loading? So let's see how we can use extension functions to maybe make this a little bit more expressive. So here's our extension function. 
Um, in order to declare it as an extension function, we have the class that it's extending, the content view model, and then the name of the function dot has state. And then we pass in the state that we expect. Inside of the function, we basically just took all of the logic that you saw on the previous screen and stuck it in here. Um, one thing to know if you haven't used these, this is the content view model that you're calling it on. And then to use it, you can just have the view model call dot has state, and then you pass in the state that you expect. And this does the exact same thing as that version that we saw a couple slides ago, but it's a lot more expressive and easier to read. And there's so many different possibilities with this. And something that pairs nicely with it is infix functions. Again, making things more readable. With them, you can essentially take extension functions or member functions. Um, but use them without the dot and the parentheses. You bring another level of reading like a sentence to your tests. Some notes on using these and creating these. Um, they must be member functions or extension functions. They have to have a single parameter. And the parameter can't ac accept a variable number of arguments, and it can't have a default value. And these can be really helpful for readability, for more natural reading tests, and they can be really helpful for assertions. So here is another example. And here's an example without using the infix function. We have this method to verify that the tip is correct. And inside of it, we have an assertion, hey, does this view have this text? But that's kind of a lot to read just to get at, does this view have this text? We have on view, with ID, give it the ID, check, matches, with text, tip, when we just want to know, does text tip have the string tip? So let's create a helper infix function. So first looking at the signature, it starts with the keyword infix. That makes it an infix function. And then we're extending int because that idea of the view is an integer. And with the way that we want it to read, which we'll see in the next slide, um, you want it to be called on this int. And we're calling it should have text and passing it the expected string. Inside of it, again, we put all that logic you saw in the previous slide. So then to call it, we say we have the ID our dot ID dot text tip. This is how we identify the view. Then should have text and then tip. So we're calling this function, but without the dot, without the parentheses, and it reads like a sentence. It's pretty great. Before looking at a couple other feature features, um, I wanted to look at this example. It combines a lot of the stuff that we've looked at before. Um, we looked at some robot code, and this is from what we looked at. We have a higher order function with a receiver type. Um, it's also inline and refied. So this is just so that we didn't have to pass in a type as a parameter to create an instance. Um, right now, we have it in those angle brackets. And we're passing in a lambda as a parameter. But that's also an extension function. If you look, you have robot as the name. Then in the um, parentheses, we have block, which is the name of our variable. And then a function type that's t dot parentheses. So this function will be called on an instance of t, which happens to be a robot, um, and then returns unit. So that's a lot of different features in one little package to create um, a helper thing to make your tests more expressive. All right, next feature. For creating test data and using default and named parameters, data classes can be really helpful. For data classes, the main purpose is usually to hold data. Um, often, all the properties can be passed through the constructor. And the constructor can have default and named parameters. 
And this can be really helpful for creating test data easily, setting the properties that you care about and only the properties that you care about. Because they're easier to create, it means you're less likely to need mocks because the real thing is just easy to create. Uh, here's a data class. You don't need to know too much about it other than it has a lot of properties that all get passed into the constructor. And they all also have default parameters. Now, if you're creating it, we'll call it the normal way, the maybe Java E way, um, you'd have to pass in everything that that constructor requires. And one, this can be really annoying to write. And then two, like just looking at this, it's hard to know which of these values do we actually care about in this test. Because some of these are just here because we had to pass something in. And some of these we care about as our test data for whatever we're testing. Now, if we take advantage of named parameters and default values, we can just pass in the text and the source URL that we may care about in this test. And then everything else defaults to whatever the default value is. And that's fine, because we don't care what those values are, at least not in this test. All right, let's look at one more feature before we start diving into libraries. Lazy property delegation. So with this, the value gets computed only upon first access. And it can be really great for values that you don't always need or that you want to put a name to. So here's one for example. We have this error message. We only use it in tests that we're testing an error. And if we're not running those tests, we don't care that this value is instantiated. On top of that, this value is just a random string. We could put this random string just like in our code where we use it. But by assigning it to this property, and especially only when we need it, we can put a name to it. So when we use it, it's easier to read. We're like, oh, this value is an error message, not there's a random string here. What does it mean? Let me look up. Oh, OK, it's an error message. It's a lot quicker to read and understand that way. Before we move on from this section, I wanted to point out this talk, um, Maintainable UI Test by Leveraging Kotlin. It was pre presented at Paris Android Makers this year. Um, it talks about um, espresso integration tests and striving to get high-level clean tests using Kotlin DSL and extension methods. It walks through how to use a lot of these features that we talked about and how they use them to create their own domain-specific language for their tests. It's really cool. And if you're curious about this stuff, I suggest that you look at it. Um, I do have a link to it. I have um, all the talk resources on my Twitter, and I, I'll show you the link on one of the last slides so that you can get a hold of that. And just a quick sneak peek of it. Um, it follows the given when then structure, and you can see that it's a lot of blocks. So we have like the Gwen block of the start, then we have a block for given, and a block for whenever, and a block for then, with some other cool stuff in there. And it's really cool to see how it is that they leveraged these Kotlin features to do all of this. And again, I have the link to these resources for you to quickly pull it up. All right, so we got through all of those language features, and they can be really powerful. And that's why there's so many libraries that take advantage of these. And they can take some of the boilerplate out of using these features for us so we don't have to build these things ourselves and help improve our tasks for us. So the first one that we'll look at is Kakao. It's, this one is specific to Android. It provides a DSL for writing expressive espresso tests, which is kind of hard to say. Um, and it can make UI tests more fun to read and easier to understand. To use it, you start by creating your screen. So here we have a search screen. 
that extends from their screen class. And in it, you just define whatever views that you're going to need in your test. So here we have a search button, and we have a snack bar. And then to use it, this will look really familiar and similar to the robots that we looked at. We just have a screen block, and then we perform whatever we need to inside. So we're going to click the search button, and then check that the snack bar is displayed. And this is how you use it in your tests. You can see that it leverages higher order functions a lot. Um, it in itself is a DSL. Another cool one is spec. This one is multi-platform, so you can use it anywhere that you have your Kotlin code. It follows an RSpec style, if you're familiar with Ruby. Um, so it's very declarable in that way. Um, its biggest goal is human readability. In fact, they don't call their tests tests. They call them specifications. So to look at an example, um, here is a test for or a spec for a profile. It uses nested blocks, so ultimate higher order functions. Um, each layer is, you can have groups or tests, so they have nice ways of organizing your code. And here we're using given, on, and it blocks. So the given and on, it can be used to organize your tests, and then the it has your assertions in it. So you could have multiple on blocks in the Twitter profile. Maybe we have one for validate image count here. We could have another one that's maybe character count. And then we have the validations. And they're named with full strings. So you can, again, write things in a sentence-like structure, which is cool once you see the error messages. Um, here, the error message says, given a Twitter profile on validate image count, it should be valid for four images. But it wasn't, so something's wrong. It expected true, and it was actually false. So this is a really neat one for especially organizing your tests and getting these nice error messages. Next, we'll look at Makito Kotlin. This is a small library that provides helper functions to work with Makito and Kotlin. So it's built on top of Makito. And if you're not familiar with what that library is, it's a mocking library. So you can create mocks and stubs and spies and um, stub out methods and verify something was called. And it has some great helpers just to make Kotlin features or Makito features just a little bit more Kotlin-y. So here's an example of just plain Makito, no Makito Kotlin. So we are creating a mocked update, which is created just by calling mock and then passing it the class. And then whenever to string is called on this update, we want it to return the string update. And then you might pass this mock to maybe your test subject, especially if it's a unit test, so you can isolate your code. You only want to test your test subject and not all its dependencies, so maybe you mock out your dependencies. Now, the same thing using Makito Kotlin looks more like this. So we're still creating our mock, and then we can pass it a block for some of our stubs. So here we're passing it a block that's saying that on to string, so when to string is called, do return, return the string update. So this is a different way of writing the same thing. And this can come down to preferences again. If you prefer to write and read something like this, you don't need Makito Kotlin. But if you like the way this looks and it's easier for you to read, you can use this one. Another library is called Cluent. And it's a fluent assertions library for Kotlin. It uses infix notations and extension functions in Makito to provide a fluent wrapper around JUnit assertions in Makito. It supports normal function invocation inline and with backticks, depending on your preference. So I think it's really cool that in this library itself, it 
caters to people with different preferences depending on how you like to read and write your code, what you find personally to be more expressive. And as an example, here's all the same method called three different ways. The first one is using should equal um, as infix. So we have message and then space, and then should equal, and then we pass in hello. The second line, this is using the traditional dot and parentheses call. And then finally, the last one uses that back tick. So there can be a space between should and equal to look more like a natural sentence. And they have lots of these assertions. They have should and should not equal, should and should not be, should and should not be an instance of. They have more for numerical assertions, for strings and collections. They also have a generic should to create your own assertions. They also have some exception handling. So here's saying that if you invoke the method read, it should throw an I.O. exception. Um, and again, we're seeing how much they are trying to make your test read fluently like a sentence. When I got to this one, I was amazed because I didn't believe that it was code at first. This is a wrapper for Makito Kotlin that we just looked at. So this is saying, so the first one, verify on mocked update that mocked update dot two string was called. So this is saying that two string should have been called on this mocked update. And then the next one is when calling stub dot length, it returns four. So this is stubbing something out so that when maybe your test subject calls dot length on the stub, that it returns four. And then one more library that we're going to look at is Biscotti. This is just a small one that we're using internally at Buffer for our Android tests. And we looked at the verify link opened towards the beginning. And this is from that same library. Here we have verify activity launched, which is just saying, hey, this screen should have been launched, basically. So here we're saying that the main screen should be should be launched uh, when we click this FAQ button. And it's just one of the ways that we're able to take some of these properties, bring them into something that we use specifically in our own tests to build our own thing. Um, I do have all of the resources for this talk um, at this link. You visit my GitHub, Veganda, set talk resources. I also um, put it in a comment on the Meetup page, and it's on my Twitter. So all these ways you can find it. Um, you can also reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions after today. Um, I'm happy to chat about any of it. And with that, um, I hope that you were able to learn something new or find something you might want to try or even just learn a little bit more about your own preferences. And I'd encourage you to maybe experiment with some things. Find out what works best for you, what works best for your team, um, what doesn't work so that you can learn from it, and just to try stuff out and see what's out there. Thank you. Um, I think we're small enough. If there's questions, we can have a whole discussion. So I don't know if there's any questions. I'll start. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, the one with the fluent library with all the infix functions. Yeah. That read like English. Uh, I don't know. Is there like a real practical use case for that? Hello. Yeah. Oh, that's so uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I found that using infix functions. I mean, this I I haven't actually considered a lot of these things for mm -hmm. testing specifically. So uh, you know I. It's kind of a new shift of thinking for me. So, like, what I found normally with infix functions in Kotlin with like uh, code base systems itself, it can be a little frustrating because sometimes uh, folks like go crazy with infix functions. And then, you know, 
it, it's a lot of tribal knowledge, just like knowing what the preference is. And I was wondering if maybe you've tried out coolant yourself and if it might be like a little bit nicer for testing. Um, I haven't, this is one I haven't personally used. Um, I personally don't like as much infix functions. Um, yeah. I like, like my brain works to enjoy seeing the dot and the parentheses. So I think this is definitely one that comes down to preference. I do think that there's a little bit, um, like the discoverability is a little bit harder on with using infix functions. I know a lot of the times, like if I'm testing or writing code in general, I'll do that dot be like, okay, what are my options? Or type a couple characters. It's like, I want something that tests for an error. So I'll do dot error. Okay, this is the one that I want. So I feel like you might use a little bit of that with functions. So I think whatever infix functions you add, you want it to be manageable so that you can remember them and everyone on the team can know that they're there. So I don't know if anyone else has more experience with infix, infix functions that can share their experience. It, it's interesting for me to see infix functions here because yeah to your point it's different ways of expressing it mm -hmm. um, i think where i saw infix functions first was a long time ago in haskell it, it was and it was used there as a way to make your code extremely mathematically symbolic which i actually that makes don't sense like. it's very hard to read <clears throat> so it's interesting to see it go from what it looks like is you know, originally Let's make our code as you know mathematically unreadable as possible <laughs> to actually full circle around to let's actually make our code more readable mm -hmm. by applying this to English sentences and phrases. So yeah. I don't know if anyone else has seen infix, infix functions, but that's basically kind of I think where they came from. That's where I had originally seen them. So <laughs> Success. <laughs> um, just from curiosity, with the concept of mocking in general, mm -hmm. um, what have you found to be the best balance where you can use mocking to stub things quickly, get things going quickly, but avoid like the abuse of it where like literally everything gets mocked and then wrong assumptions are made during development? Oh, that's a tricky one. Just because like everyone will draw that line in a different place. Um, I feel like we lean closer to the side of mocking everything. We have like a lot of helpers be like, oh, mock this thing just to make it easy. Because for our unit test, we want it to be like true unit test and that we're not testing any of the dependencies. We're not testing um, any of that. We're just testing that class, that unit itself. So personally, like we lean like farther that way in our unit tests, and then we have like our big integration into end test, and we don't have a whole lot in between. Um, but again, like that can fall into some wrong assumptions. Wrong assumptions. Um, maybe that stub isn't what it would actually return in real life, and I don't have a good solution for that. I feel like that pendulum's always going to be swinging. We'll like do too many uh, stubs, mocks, learn from that swing the other way. Um, I think, I haven't tried this out too much, but I think a good thing to try would be if the dependency is easy enough to create, then go ahead and create it. But I've also run into when I'm trying to create all the dependencies that I spend all the time creating and building these objects so they have the exact right value to perform the exact right thing that I need for this exact test. So. I think it's all just experience in learning and trying things and failing and trying another thing. So I don't know if anyone else has something to say about that. Uh, first, uh, only uh, use J unit. So I was curious if you used uh, spec um, for like either with Studio or ID but every one of those like in uh, it cases. Uh, I don't use it personally, but I did it once to write this talk. Um, each, if I remember correctly, each it 
is its own test case. So, yeah. Um, you had another question um, for Lockheedian. Mm -hmm. I think by default, you can't mock uh, final classes, which is more common. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can either expose it to be open. There's also a plugin that you can use, the Marquito. Huh? Oh, I haven't tried that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kashik, kind of. So <laughs> my cat will get very curious about the hedgehog and like will like lay next to it and be happy and then be like, hmm, what is this thing? Even though I've know you'd had it for a while, but I'm curious again. And we'll get like really close and like almost nose up to it or like touch it with his paw and be like, oh, this thing's pokey, as if he's never learned of that before. <laughs> so they're really funny, but ultimately usually they just kind of chill. The hedgehog doesn't really care as long as the cat doesn't get too close. <laughs> Who came first? The cat. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we moved on to hedgehog and cat questions. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, reminder once again, CFP for Kotlin Everywhere Chicago, August 23rd. It is available now. 
So don't be shy. Don't, yeah. don't be shy. Submit. Submit. Please. Um, we would love to see you all there in either a speaking or attending capacity. So, yeah. What's the date? August 20th. August 23rd. Friday, okay. August 23rd from 1 until 5 is the content. And then afterwards, probably up here for a happy hour networking. There are posters over there. You're welcome to take some, and you're welcome to bring it back to your uh, workplace, too, if you want. So uh, that'll definitely have it. But otherwise, we'll post everything on Slack, too. And then one final last thing. I want to try and start the tradition of lingering in bars rather than in pivotal space now. Um, <laughs> I have a very small child at home that I need to return home to. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, we really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. And we'll try and, like, if there's nothing, just migrate this to some nearby uh, watering hole. Here, here, man. We can just hang out here. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. Yeah.